And I went in and he closed the door. And I said, can I get a reference letter? He said, actually, Darren, I think you're pretty unimpressive. Today, we have the pleasure of having the Dean of Sauter Business School, Darren Dow. I like to be a leader that's a role model. I like to be a leader that listens. And I like to be a leader that supports people to be better. And so now you have AI coming in and, and people are saying, oh, that's disruptive. We have to block it. You're not going to block it. I think like when we go see a medical doctor, right? Do you ever ask your doctor? Have you ever asked them? What was your grades? For me, what success is now. Before we let the stories of the past shape your future, it would mean the world to me if you could follow us or subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to us. Enjoy the conversation. So without any further ado, Brandon, let the stories of the past shape your future on the Quoting, Quoting Life podcast. podcast. Darren, thank you so much for coming on the Quoting Life podcast. Uh, it's, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Someone, a professor told me that you love Legos and I love Legos as well. And now looking back on when I was a kid, I realized that my love for Legos was actually related to my love for creativity and entrepreneurship. Sure. Do you have any moments as a kid that you can look back on now that would Explain the person you are today. Well, that's a great question. Um, the, the Legos is funny because when I used to teach creativity, I was trying to, because as a prof, you're always trying to figure out, like, how can we do something in class that's going to be just different, right? It's going to, like, pff, spark the game a bit. And I thought, you know, Legos are awesome. Mm -hmm. So I went to this, the Lego store, and I'm like, how much would it cost, right, to buy a bunch of Lego for class? And then they're <laughs> like, well, how many students? I'm like, ah, like, maybe 50. And they're like... $5,000. <laughs> so I went back to the school here. And I'm like, uh, can I have $5,000? Like, for what? I'm like, Lego. And they're like, shut up. And I'm like, no, really. And they actually, they gave me the funds. So wow. uh, downstairs, I think Kari Markin has it now. There's like 10 bins <laughs> oh, wow. packed with Lego. So, you know, if you get a chance at some point in, in, in the coursework to take a creativity class, you might see this roaming Lego <laughs> that we purchased way back in the day. For me, uh, you know, what I would point to, what I always look back at, was, you know, just after school hanging out with my buds. Um, mm -hmm. I lived uh, in a place called Shore Park, which is just outside of Edmonton. And, like, my backyard, like, went on to this large field farming community type of area. And I can remember vividly, like, being six, seven, eight, you know, way back in the day. Yeah. And uh, after school, just hanging out with my, my buddies, you know, just dreaming up crazy scenarios right like we were fighting a war we were you know saving people from destruction you know just creating just having fun and uh, being outside and using the woods and the farm and all this area uh, to just create I would say different different worlds different experiences different frames and that you know kind of stayed with me that notion of play mm. and that's what's meant you know with this Lego stuff is you know sometimes as we get older, we lose that notion of, of play because school's like no fun for you, right? You gotta yeah. study, you gotta pass, you gotta get good grades. It's pretty hard, it's pretty stressful. And so sometimes people lose that sense of play. And so, you know, keeping that in your back pocket as you continue to get older, right, is a big part of, I believe, being successful. Is that something you also think is changing with modern day today? Where, because, even parents, like, they try to sign their kids up for so many different things. And yeah. I've heard someone say that it's a problem that we're not allowing our kids to just have some free time, be bored. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people say that. I, I do kind of lean to that side. I think sometimes we over-program, right? Because, you know, you know to get into university, and you guys know this very well, right? You have to get great grades, and you have to, like, have work experience, you have to be the president of a club, you have to be really good at some sport, and you have to play the violin, you have to cure cancer, like, you have to do all of these different things to get into university, and, like, where's the time just to, like, screw around and have some fun, like, do something, you know, a little bit, you know, not so programmed, and so I think there's value in giving, you know, kids people in university like you, like a little bit of space, right? Obviously, I want you to go to class, I want you to study, but I hope you have enough time that you can, you know, do things that you think, you know, give you a little bit of room to just have fun and be a kid, right? right. I look back on it and I used to get in trouble so much, <laughs> but that made me, I think, better because, you know, I'm willing to take risks. I'm willing to try something new. And if you're in a very structured environment, 
you, know, you don't always do that. This idea, right, gives you guys a bit of an opportunity to play, have some yeah, fun, absolutely. do something different, right, and create. Yeah, and I know as the dean, you probably have a really busy schedule. I know we're kind of on a time crunch here, but like going back to play, how do you find yourself giving yourself free time, um, setting time aside to kind of play and enjoy your life? It's a great question. So it's been harder, I'm just being honest, since becoming the dean. At first I was like, ah, what does a dean do? I'm going to have so much time to like <laughs> play Overwatch, right? I'm going to be fine. Um, <laughs> but it's been really busy. So mm. for me, like the time I would say that is play for me is actually mainly with my kids right now. So I've got teenagers. Mm. And, you know, we do things that we think are fun. And, and some of it is playing video games with my kids. Some of it's going to movies together. Some of it is, you know, just hanging out on the couch, talking about stuff. So I, every day I try to make sure I've got a chunk of time that I can just spend having having a bit of fun and getting involved in my, my kids' lives. They keep me young, so to speak. I have a 10-year-old a son who... Uh, you know, he always wants to set fire to something. <laughs> and so half of the fun is watching that and then yeah. <laughs> cleaning up the mess, if that makes sense to you. Right, right. And um, back during the start of the school year, me and my friends were wandering around Sauter. <laughs> and then suddenly we got caught over by an adult. And we kind of panicked for a moment. But then uh, it was you. And you introduced yourself as the dean. And we kind of chatted for a little bit. And you... Uh -huh gave us a good impression of what's to come throughout the school year. And <laughs> a little bit about impressions. Like, do there's definitely a lot of talented, a lot of like highly intelligent individuals out there. Mm -hmm. But do you think it's the impression that kind of um, personal impression that keeps them getting promoted and going further in life? So I, well I think it's a combination of things. So mm -hmm. so you are right. You know, being good at what you're doing, right? Being smart, being creative, really being productive. Like, that's a big part of getting promoted. You don't get promoted just on, you know, how good you are as a communicator or how persuasive you are. You have to have the, the evidence, right? And so I think you want to think as you go through your undergrad, like, are you building your toolbox? Are you getting good at doing case studies? Are you getting good at, you know, doing the financials? And to make sure that you have those hard skills, that you can point to and say, yeah, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. But then the other half is, like, how do you show up? Like, what kind of energy do you bring to the workplace, right? Mm -hmm. And we all love to meet people that are positive, that you meet them, and you're like, I want to be around that person. Or, you know, that person is kind of cool. And, and that type of, I don't know, you can call it charisma, you can call it energy, you can call it positivity. You know, that actually really helps. And some people just seem born with it, right? Like you may have met yeah. people and you're like, Absolutely. why are they A, so happy? And B, like, why, why are they just like a magnet to other people, right? And sometimes it's just some magic sauce that happened. But sometimes it's something they've learned over time, right? They've realized that, you know, in class, in life, you're always better off when you, you look at things as a, as a, as a glass half full, half full, not half empty, right? That, that there's this opportunity to just say, wow. I'm lucky to be here. I'm lucky to be just having fun and, and doing cool things, right? That, that I can leverage as I find new opportunity and as I find room to grow. So I think that's what I tell you. It is a balance. You want that hard skill stuff, but you want to make sure that you're working on who you are, that you can bring that positive so that people are like, that person, that's who I want to hire. Like that's, and, and employers tell me this, right? They say, you know what I love about some of the kids, not all the kids, yeah. but some of the kids I see at Sauter is like they're so positive. Like they just really want to get in there. They want to work hard. They want to make an impact. You know, that's the kind of people that, that everybody wants. Do you realize the importance of that later on in life or sooner? Totally. I was reading something that you're apparently <laughs> super productive. It was an article when you won an award this year the, yeah, from the SCP, and it said it that you were so productive with 90,000 uh, articles published. So, so I, if, if, I guess we have the time, but I'll, I'll tell you the story of why that happened. Because no, I was not like that over time. I finished uh, university, like you guys, at BCom. Mm -hmm. I did an accounting, and because uh, my parents said you should go into accounting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my aunt, yeah. <laughs> parents. Uh, but as I was waiting to go into grad school, I, I had like six months to kill. So I took a job at a restaurant, a 
a place called Tony Roma's, a place for ribs. And I had my degree and I had done a, some work in accounting. And I went to work at this restaurant and they hired me as a manager. And so I had to, not the top manager, but like an assistant manager. Yep. Right? And so I had to like supervise people and make sure that food costs, you know, do kind of the management stuff. And as I was finishing the job there, to moving to BC, I thought, oh, I should get a reference letter. Always good when you do a great job. Right, go get a reference letter or ask the the big boss for a reference letter. And I went to ask the boss, and he, I'll remember forever. His name was Dave Murphy, and uh, really nice guy. I said, "Hey, I'm, I mean, my last day is next week. Can I get a reference letter?" And he's like, uh, "Why don't you come to the back office?" I'm like, "Okay, cool." Went to the back office where he had his desk and stuff, and I went in. And he closed the door, and I said, "Can I get a reference letter?" And he said, "Actually, Darren, I think you're pretty unimpressive." <laughs> wow. Yeah. Punch right. Yeah. And I was like. Phew. Like, what? <laughs> what? He's like, you just, you're not a hard worker. Hmm. He says, you think you're better than everybody else. No one here has a university degree. You have a university degree, right? You've done accounting. You're really smart. But you're just arrogant. You're cocky. You come in and you sit in the bar and you read the paper and you order people around. And I just, I don't, can't give you good reference. I'm not really that impressed by you. And I thought right then and there, like, this goes two ways, right? I could either be like, well, F you, right? <laughs> yeah. Or I could say, okay, like, why did that happen? Like, what is it about my game that made this guy, who I respect, still respect, have that kind of reaction to me? And yeah. I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? He's right. I'm kind of a loser. Like, I'd always gotten good grades, right? I'd always, I killed in my undergrad. Mm -hmm. You know, I was one of those... Hot shots. Yeah. But I didn't I didn't work. And I know I didn't. Hmm. I just rested on my laurels. And so right there, that was the turning point of my life, actually, in terms of work. Because I'm like, you know what? I never want that to happen again. I never want people to say, that guy doesn't work hard. He may not be any good. That's separate, right? But I never wanted someone to say, like, Darren Dell doesn't work hard. And hmm. so that, that, you know, and those are points in your life. And you guys have probably had some of those already, right? Where... Someone says something, or you do something, or you fail at something, and it just makes you say, okay, I, I want to change the game. And so that's, that's really, for me, like a big turning point, is I realized that I'd be more successful if I outworked everybody. And so even in the dean job, I want people that work for me, right? There's 200 professors and 350 staff to be like, you know, the dean works hard. Like, he's a hardworking guy. Like, that's what I want people to be able to say. So it seems as if... Before you were an authoritarian leader, so <laughs> what type of leader? <laughs> what type of leader would you describe yourself as today? Um, so if, if yeah, and I was like that. That's totally right. Authoritarian. I don't know if you learned that in first year, but that's an excellent <laughs> way to frame it. Um, I would say, and I mean, there's books on this, right? Like eaters, leaders eat last, yep, and this type of servant right. leadership. I, you know, they're all fancy buzzwords of what type of leader you are I, I like to be a leader that's a role model I like to be a leader that listens and I like to be a leader that supports people to be better and, and the one you know catchphrase I like is is good leaders create leaders behind them hmm. that if you're a really great leader right the people that are working with you and working for you are going to be able to replace you pretty quickly because you've been able them to be leaders and, and that requires a few things, right? It requires you to listen. It requires you to think about mentoring. It requires you to make hard decisions. Good leaders make hard decisions. And it requires you to be honest and, and, and be transparent. And, and I'm trying. I'll tell you guys right now, like, I've screwed up a ton, right? Mm. Whenever you get in these, like, fancy positions, you're going to make mistakes. So it's about being honest about it and saying, okay, do better next time, Right? Um, sometimes I think we're so scared of failing, and I would point to your generation. You guys succeeded everything, right? Like, you guys are rock to be at solder. You got to be like a rock star, right? And, and I remember when I first went to grad school, I got like a, the lowest mark in the class, and I almost lost my mind. And I know for many new students at solder, right? You were always like really high at your school, and yeah. now you're with everybody that's really high, <laughs> and you're average. You're like, what? Like, don't you know me, right? And yeah. so it's. It's getting used to this notion of, of it's okay to fail. Like, I can learn from it. And as a real leader, you have to be comfortable with that. So those are the things I'm working on, you know, work in progress. I'm sure that's not something you've learned right off the bat, that failing is okay. No. How, it, like, what types of failures did you have before? How was that journey like? 
well, one was coming to school here and, and being the like the you can't say the word anymore, but the dumbest in the class, yeah. right? Like I was, I was the I know I was. Hmm. The prof told me, <laughs> so I was like, does that oh. make you feel insecure? Or totally. Or, you know? And it's no, I think that's normal. We often, when we come to university, and maybe that happened in high school once in a while, you know, you realize, wow, I have to work harder. I, I'm not the best at something. And that's okay. Like, mm-hmm. that's, you know, good in many ways because it humbles you a little bit and you realize there's room to grow, right? And so that was one big thing for sure. Certainly in, in my career, there's been places where it hasn't gone well. I remember teaching, because uh, you can teach in the regular degree programs, but Mm -hmm. you can also teach executives. And I remember going to do a session um, with a big company, and in the morning I thought I did really great. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoon, like, only like two people showed up. (laughs) I'm like, where is everybody? They're like, and the people that showed up said they didn't feel it was worthwhile listening to you. I'm like, oh, ouch. Ouch. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) I'm like, okay, I sucked. (laughs) And so you learn, right? That was a huge fail for me, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so you can look at, and I'm much older, obviously, than you guys. You can look all through life, you know, where you haven't done well. Those failures, they can they can be a problem for you or they can empower you. Hmm. So I guess my advice would be, you know, I'm not saying go out and fail. Like, don't go fail your exams, okay? Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> right. But I'm saying when you have something that you don't do amazing at, take a step back and say, okay, like, how can I learn from that? and not do that again next time around. Right, and I know like within student community, there's a lot of pressure to not fail. There's courses known as GP uh, booster Boosters? Yeah, 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 of course. So like students would take those over something The wine that, tasting class. Yeah, there's yeah. that. And then, like students would, I know a lot of people who would much rather take these boost, uh, great booster classes over classes that they may hold interest in. And I know like, there's also this pressure to keep a high grade and Neil deGrasse Tyson said something that um, students cheat on exams because the school system like values the grades over day value of learning. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? I, I think it's a problem. I'm just being honest, right? Like, hmm. we have to have grading. Okay, I'll say that right out of the gate. I wish in many ways we didn't. Why but, do we need to? Uh, to hold people accountable, right? And it's like when you think about a class, right? If I said, oh, do all these things, but these four things you don't have to do because there's no grade, or I should say do them, but there's no grade, people don't do them, right? right. If there isn't participation marks, people don't participate. They don't come, right? So we know this, that people need to be incentivized. This is like a basic of life, right? Like you do what you get rewarded for. So the grades are necessary, right? Because it, it incentivizes, it helps people to discipline themselves. I get that. The problem is, right, with grades, is then it becomes the end-all, be-all. Yeah. And people will do things that are not cool, right? Because they're stressed out or they're panicking. And so then they make a bad choice and they cheat on something, right? Or, yeah. you know, they steal something from a friend, right? Like, who knows yeah. what people, at the end of the day, might do. And that's the, the, the tipping point of what we don't... I hope that doesn't happen. I hope that, you know, you can still... Have the free time to do some fun things and not become so possessed by grades that, you know, you don't do that. So it's a balance thing. And I think as I've gotten older, I've realized that, you know, everything's a balance. Yes, we need grades to incentivize, but the grades shouldn't be the only thing that matters. That when you go out to get a job, I would hope the company you're working for doesn't say, oh, like, what's your grade? And then they don't care about all the other things you did. Developing a podcast, being in a student group, right? Working your way through university with a a part-time job, right? Because maybe you didn't have the same resources someone else did. Like, those things matter just as much as the grades. And I often think, like, when we go see a medical doctor, right? Do you ever ask your doctor, have you ever asked them, what was your grades? No. Like, what were, were you the last in your class? Like, when you think about it, wouldn't you want to not have the doctor that was the worst in their class? But have you ever asked that question? No. Because it doesn't matter. They got, they passed, they got the degree, they're a doctor. In many ways, we should think about it the same way. Like, you got through. That's the most important thing, right? And do you have those other elements that you learned at university that add to who you are? Now, I realize I can say that, Mm -hmm. and everyone listening is going to be like, yeah, whatever, doll. (laughs) Grades are the most important thing. Yeah. I would just say, sure, but try to take a step back and say, you know, 
20, 30, 40 years from now, does it matter that you got an 84 versus an 82? It doesn't. Yeah. Nobody cares. Sorry. Nobody cares. Yeah. Right? So as long as you're doing well, and everyone defines their own well, I get that. You know, that's the most important thing, I think. But I understand. It's hard. That's a hard one. I'm wondering, you said how we define well. How do you define success? Well, I don't... So this... I used to think it was very linear in terms of, like, get a good job, make yeah. some good coin, right? Have a happy family. Mm -hmm. You know, I had that kind of whole North American thing, dream, yeah, right? right? And I've come to realize that success is very different for, for everyone, right? And some people say, you know, what success is for me is lots of money. And I know there's lots of people at SADA that that is success. I know success for other people was like making an impact in the world, like making it better. And let's say climate change is something that you're passionate about. That would be success. Or maybe success is relationships, right? I want to build really good relationships with people so that I can look at them and we both know, like, I got you. I'll take a bullet for, you know, that means success. Other people think success is that more traditional, you know, I want whatever a family might look like. It means different things today, right? As it should. But, you know, having kids maybe might be someone's idea of success. So I think there's lots of different layers of what success might look like. I think it's on us to say, you know, your flight path is you. And, and as long as you're feeling good about it, you know, you should be able to say that you're successful. Um, for me, what success is now is obviously related to my kid. You always, and it's hard. I mean, I think when you're interviewed, like, yeah, whatever, I don't even know what you're talking about about kids, but... As you get older, that becomes a big... And your parents probably feel the same way. They want mm. you guys to have the opportunities maybe that they didn't have, right? Mm. And you want them to realize their dreams. That's, so that's a parent thing. So that's big for me now because I have teenagers. Um, but in terms of the career, I think for me success means like making sure that Sauter, UBC, you know, is, continues to be a great place to come and have your view, your life change. Like I hope that you guys, as you go through the program, and there's going to be some good times and <laughs> some crappy yeah. times, right? But I hope after you leave, you're like, wow, you know, that four years or five years <laughs> or six years, no judgment, <laughs> right? I hope that's going to be something you can look back on and say, man, those were some of the best years of my life because it just changed the way I see the world and it's made me a better person. Like, that would be success for me. So then, what are you doing as a dean to try for us to have that experience? Well, a couple things. Um, first and foremost, make, making sure that the program remains strong. Like, the BCom program has a great reputation. Yeah. I go talk to alumni, like, every week. I'm in different places. I was in New York a couple weeks ago. And one of the things they asked me is, like, hey, is the program still tough? <laughs> it's still tough. <laughs> are the kids still good? Yeah, they're still good. In fact, they're better than you. That's what I like to say. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so there's there's a responsibility for me to keep keep the standards, to keep the program strong, hmm. to not let it go backwards, right? Right? And it might be fun to make it all easy wine tasting classes, right? And nobody has to do any hard work and it's easy. Like but that's not gonna make you better. Hmm. Like I see my role is kind of like not like you guys always say, oh, we're customers, we pay a lot of money, and, you know, sure, of course. Mm -hmm. But you're not customers, you're clients, right? Mm -hmm. and, and clients are different than customers. Customers go to Disneyland, and it's just fun. Clients have a personal trainer, right? And that's mm -hmm. my job, is you're coming to the gym to work out. And I'm supposed to give you heavy weights, because i got to make you strong, right? Mm -hmm. And when you start complaining, I'm like, put on another plate. Right, because I want to make you strong enough that when you get out there, you can be successful, whatever that means to you. And you are better than, not better, but you can run with, right? Some kid out of Rotman or McGill or Ivy, right? That's my job is to make sure that as your trainer, and that's all the faculty's job, that we're challenging you, that we're making sure that that you know you're becoming better people by pushing you a little bit. I mean, it's nice to have some candy floss and ponies and really fun things, too. Yeah. But the job here is to, to make you, truthfully, to make you better. Sometimes people say, we our customer society. We're, we're, we're here to help young people realize their dreams and become better, right? Hmm. He's like, I don't know. I'll think about that one. <laughs> no, I, like, I completely agree with it. I think it's such a better way to see it as we're clients rather than 
customers. That's the way I see it. So that's one thing, I guess I, I should say the second part of your question was, what are you doing to make it better? I think education's evolving. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we can see that with the implementation of AI technology and how yeah, everyone's I, using it in the school. And that's going right? to happen, and so we have to figure out, you know, how does that become part of the curriculum? But the, the education needs to be more experiential as we continue to move forward. I completely agree. And 20 years ago, like, it's always hard because you're a student here for a very quick snapshot. Yeah. But 20 years ago, it was just some guy at the front going, blah, 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 blah. And everyone's like, <sighs> and there's still a lot of that. Yeah. But now there's also more experiences that you can have, certainly mm -hmm. in the year, year three and year four, right? Solder Africa, PMF, Absolutely. New Venture Design. Like, we can start naming courses that didn't exist 20 years ago. But we're going to see more of that, more experiential type of learning to give you guys these opportunities to, you know, do really cool things and learn by doing more than learning by listening. You'll need a balance, back to balance, but that's on me to, to you know, make better, or uh, make more enhanced learning experiences come to life. Right, and you brought up like incorporating AI with education. Can you kind of walk us through how you're kind of doing that? Because I know there's ChatGPT and mm -hmm. um, school accounts that as plagiarism, like how do you, um, see yourself tackling this issue? Well, it's going to be an evolution, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. ChatGPT is a disruptor. Broadly, AI is a disruptor. But, you know, go way back in time, right? <laughs> 50 years ago, let's say. Right? Calculators, computers, laptops. These were disruptors too. I remember, I'm that old, right? People had a laptop and you're like, what the heck? You can't bring that to class. Satan out, right? And they'd be really mad. And it was disruptive. And so now you have AI coming in and, and people are saying, oh, that's disruptive. We have to block it. You're not going to block it, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to become part of the workplace, part of the educational experience. Yeah. So it's a transition, right? Now, obviously, there's going to be moments where you need um, a, a testing ground, right, that you don't rely on chat GPT. So how does that happen? Well, maybe it's oral exam. Maybe it's something in class that you write. But I would expect over time you're going to have assignments and, and pedagogy, the learning, right, that says, okay, ChatGPT does this, use it over here, then use it over here, now marry it, right, and use that as a tool like you use a computer, like you use a calculator way back in the day. It just becomes another tool, right? So it's the adjustment of that, and what's cool for you guys is you're, like, experiencing it in real time, whereas mm -hmm. kids, like, 10 years from now, they'll be like, yeah, whatever, like, that's yeah. just part of life. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas you guys are seeing the disruption in front of you, yeah, and so you, for good or for bad, you may be like, "Oh, why can't we use it in this class?" And they're like, "No, you can't use it. It's academic dishonesty." It's because it's part of the evolution, right? Do you think a disruptor like that harms creativity, or more so promotes it because it becomes this amazing? So, yeah, it's a great debate, right? Mm -hmm. I think you can look at it both ways. I think. I mean, it's an open quiet. Well, then we start getting into a real AI singularity type of conversation, yeah. right? You know, if AI just completely replaces what we would call human creativity in a very mm -hmm. blunt way in the discussion here, you know, maybe it's a big threat. But I, I think of AI more as a tool that facilitates. Mm -hmm. it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how far it stretches over time. Hmm. We'll see. I mean, that's the, and that's. I think that's why it's kind of a fun topic, is we can kick the ball around, but it really comes down to we'll we'll see. Yeah. Like where where and when are the limits, right? Hmm. You and that's fun for you guys. I'll be long gone by the time that gets figured out, but you guys will be you know maybe running a company or yeah. or dealing with something, and you'll you'll be right center point on that. Hmm. Any disruption creates opportunity. Always remember. Absolutely. That. And. Uh, so a tradition that we would like to do at the end of the podcast is to share the quote that the previous guest gave us. Ah! Okay, so our quote for you, uh, coming from a L'Oreal executive, is that I think pe I don't think people get rewarded for completing their to-do list. I think people get rewarded for their ideas. So what are your thoughts on that quote? Well, I think that quote stretches you, right? I think a lot of us look at life as just crossing things off the list and it becomes very much an accomplishment based let me just cross but people that really make a difference don't just cross things off the list they actually create the list 
and they actually have mm -hmm. ideas that, that, you know, it's big to say change the world. Like most of us, frankly, are not going to change the world. Like, yeah. I don't mean to crush your souls, <laughs> but most of us are going to get our degree, get a great job, maybe run a company, you know, we're going to contribute to society and I hope in a good way, right? But if we can add ideas at any level, even just small things in the company that you might start or build or work in, you know, you're making a difference. You're making people's lives better. But to me, that quote is about, you know, add something to the discussion. Don't just cross things off. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, Darren. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this episode. As a growing channel, it would be so amazing if you would take one more minute of your day to reshare this episode on any platform you're liking. Hope to see you next week.